So we're getting towards the end of the day, and I think that's kind of good because this is a kind of whimsical thing we're going to be doing here. We're going to be imagining something that I'm going to hope to convince you exists. So I have this, uh, this fantasy, this vision, that someday, 50 years from now, maybe 100 years from now, someone will come on the radio or whatever the technology of the time is to give an epistonomic update, the epistonomic news. Something like, today in the epistonomy, uh, the truth rate continues to hold strong as fake news is, remains at all-time lows. But there's dark clouds on the horizon as the hearsay index and the, tr the trust index are showing signs of softening. Now, what I just said doesn't really make sense, right? Because I'm describing something that doesn't exist. But actually, that's not exactly true. I'm describing something that we don't think exists, but actually does. This thing I call the epistonomy. Now, what is the epistonomy? We can think about the epistonomy by comparing it to the economy. Merriam-Webster's defines the economy as the structure or conditions of economic life in a country, area, or period, also an economic system. We can replace the word economic, which refers to money, resources, capital, with epistemic, which refers to of or relating to knowledge. So we can imagine that there is an epistemic system which, like our economic system, has to do with our knowledge. Is it growing? Is it shrinking? Where is it, where is it going from place to place? And so forth. Now, it would be cool if all I had to do to make this re a reality and make you all believe in it was just, you know, make a PowerPoint and remove the word economic and just put it there and done, right? Get it into Merriam's Webster's. But it doesn't quite work that way. So I'm going to try to make the case to you that the epistonomy is real and valuable to understand in two ways. First, that we can now measure the epistonomy just as we measure the economy. We now have the ability, especially with not, uh, communication technology, to do that. And second, that we now, with various theories that have been de developed in network science and related fields, we now have the ability to theorize and understand the epistonomy, much as uh, 150 years ago, people, economists, started to theorize the economy and how it might work. So let's talk about measurement. Let's talk about how we could measure the epistonomy. We measure the economy all the time very assiduously. Here you can see six different ways of just measuring the unemployment rate. And each of those is reported every month by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They send out surveys all across the country. People report back, did you find a job? Are you looking for a job? And so forth. And they report this every month. And that gives economists the ability to think about whether unemployment is increasing or not, rather than just sort of referring to you know, anecdotal data. We could do the same thing for, say, the fake news, the fake news rate. How much fake news are Americans reading this month? Was it more than last month, or is it less? A few weeks ago, or a few, sorry, a few months ago, Facebook uh, mentioned, or they announced, that they estimated 126 million Americans were exposed to fake news and other content from uh, suspected to be Russian sites. And that number is big, 126 million, oh my gosh. But actually, we don't know if that's a lot, because we don't have anything to compare it to, right? We don't know whether, that we, whether we saw more fake news in 2016 than we did, say, in 2014 elections or 2012 elections, or even just on the average Tuesday, because we don't actually keep track. But we could. Another important economic indicator is GDP. That's the indicator, in fact. GDP gets presidents elected and ousted. When the economy is growing, that means the GDP is growing, presidents get reelected. When the economy is slowing or in decline, they kick them out. So it's really important. But is it really more important than whether knowledge in the country is growing? Does America know more this year than it knew last year? That seems like that would be kind of important to know. We know whether we bought and sold more stuff, but do we know whether we know more? That's something that we could measure. That would be part of the epistonomy. Now, how could we measure these things? 
One way is pretty simple. Do what we already do with the economy. You send out surveys. We could ask people, do you think you learned more this year than you learned last year? Do you think you saw more fake news this week than you saw last week? And so forth. But beyond that, we also now have the technology to measure the epistonomy in a way that just was not possible before. In particular, all the major technology companies kind of have a piece of our epistonomic life under their uh, observation. And my ambition is that they could each share that understanding, their piece, into a common database, just like as we do with economics, so that we could study it together and understand. For example, Google knows what questions we ask. Google essentially knows what we want to know but don't, right? Because that's what a search is. I need to know this and don't know it, let me search. If you do a search for how to cook on Google Trends, you'll see a spike. You'll see that in the last 12 months, or actually in any month, you'll see that, in the, that around November, late November, all of a sudden, searches for how to cook go way up and then drop down again. Now, we all know what that is about, right? It's Thanksgiving. People want to know how to cook Thanksgiving dinner. But it's interesting to think that they're searching on Google, right? What it suggests is that actually Americans don't know how to cook Thanksgiving dinner, right? Because if they knew, they wouldn't have to search. And in fact, if you look on a chart, you'll see that if you've plotted over the last 15 years, our searches for how to cook are increasing, and on Thanksgiving, they're also increasing. What that shows is that there's something epistemically going on. Some knowledge that we used to get from each other, we now get from this database. That's something that we should know about. Google has our questions. Wikipedia has our answers. What answers do we get? News sites. Most news companies are now online. That means that they know what articles are read. They know what, Ameri what the American public is actually informed about. They know, for example, how much we read opinion and how much we read fact. That's an index that they could publish. Every newspaper in the country could submit each week saying, here's how much people read fact on our site, here's how much they read opinion. We could have an opinion index. We could look at that and say, is this increasing? I wonder why. Is it decreasing? I wonder why. Social media companies. They know not only kind of what we're sharing, but also the intensity of the relationships between different parts of the country, between people of different kinds. How much information does New York share with Iowa, say? Facebook actually knows that, basically. If you combine Facebook's data with data from the telecom companies, Verizon, T-Mobile, and so forth, you could get a sense of the intensity of communication between different areas. In fact, the originally my talk was going to be about some problems I think that are arising there, but then it occurred to me that we can't say that. We can't say that we know that there's a lack of intensity of communication because we can't prove it, but actually the data is available. These companies have it. Okay. So let's talk about what we can do with this information. Imagine that we had it. One thing is fake news. You'll note here that fake news, much like the economy, rises and falls. These are references to fake news um, in, Google and, in Google's Ngram, which means that it's showing the portion of books that are published mentioning fake news over time. And you can see that there's a boom and bust nature to fake news. Fake news is not necessarily random. It's something that becomes a hot issue in the 1920s, then in the 40s, it was pretty low for a while, and now, since the early 2000s, it's been growing. And we actually have some reasons that we understand why this happens. We know a little bit about what motivations people have for why they share, share fake news. One of them is when they're not getting the information that they need, when they're uncertain. When people want information on a topic and don't get it, they don't just put their leg, tail between their legs and say, oh, I guess I'll just wait. They don't do that. What they do is they make up stories. They say, well, if I'm not getting the information that I want, I'll just make up information that I kind of think it may be true or might want to be true, and maybe someone will correct me or who knows. That's been shown in studies of rumors since uh, World War II, that when people are highly uncertain about something, they start to make up stories. Well, with measures of, of the epistonomy, we could actually 
check whether this, is a, this condition that creates the likelihood of fake news is happening. For example, we can look at whether what people are searching for on Google is what the newspapers are actually reporting on. If we find increasingly that people are reporting or people are asking questions about topic A and the news is reporting about topic B, fake news is on its way. That's something that we, could, that we would suspect and could possibly test if this kind of data were available. Social networks. This network in the middle here is a famous network structure called the small world, um, discovered and publicized by researchers right here at Cornell, um, Duncan Watts and Stephen Strogatz. And it turns out that this network structure is associated with very effective information sharing. When, there's a, when, a, when a, any community has a small world arrangement, information moves very quickly within it, and people who are searching for information can easily find it no matter where they are in the network. Does the United States have a small world right now? Is this something that we may have been losing over time? This was my initial suspicion, something I wanted to talk about. But it occurred to me that we don't know whether this is the case because the data is not available to us. Facebook has this data. Verizon has this data. They know the structure of our network. Or we would have that structure if it were combined together. What could we do with that? Well, I read recently that economists find that Americans don't move as much as they used to. Not like, you know, move dance, but like move physically from one place to another, like to live. And it turns out that that can be very disruptive. Network scientists know this can be very disruptive to small world networks. Because one of the things that small world networks rely on is the creation of random ties, the creation of sort of random social relationships. And one of the best ways to make a random social relationship is to move to a new place and you naturally bump into new people and get to know them. If Americans are moving less, then it's quite likely that, they, that our, this small world structure has been undermined. It's possible. But rather than me speculating about it, we should track it. We should track whether our country, what our country's sort of collective network structure is. I'm not talking about individuals, who knows who, some kind of met government surveillance. I'm just talking about the aggregate statistics, just like we, we do with the economy, home prices and so forth. Now I'll leave you um, with this idea. What we measure is what we value. Of course, we measure the economy and try to predict it and understand it because we, money matters. We want to be wealthy and have resources. But it's also the case that because we measure it, because we hear about it almost every day on the news, we try to do as well as we can at that. Right? There's a target. There's growth. We want those numbers to go up. If I would tell you a number all the time, you want that number to go up. We should do the same thing with knowledge. We should value knowledge in the same way that we value the economics. We should have indices that tell us whether our knowledge is growing, whether the truth in what we're reading is increasing or decreasing. Because if we had those indices, we would value them more. So I end by asking you to do what I call the Dorothy clicking her heels exercise, right? Which was we're going to imagine something, and by imagining it and saying that we believe in it, we're going to make it so, right? We're going to say, we're going to make the epistonomy so, and here's how we do that. The next time you hear an economic indicator on the radio or read about it in the newspaper or whatever, the next time you think about an economic indicator, imagine an epistonomic indicator you'd also like to know. The next time you hear that economic growth is rising, ask yourself, well, is knowledge increasing? Are we, do we know more than we knew last year? It's great that we made more stuff than last year, but do we know more as well? I thank you for your time.